Hi there, everyone. My name is Scott Nicholson, and I'm a professor at Syracuse University School of Information Studies. And what I'm going to talk about today is something I started about a year and a half ago, the Game Designers Guild, what's gone on. First, I'll talk about how I got to this path. Then I'll talk about what we've been doing with the Game Designers Guild, and then give you some guidance if you wanted to start something like that on your own. So what led me to here? So from 2007 to 2011, I ran the Library Game Lab at Syracuse. So I come at this from being a librarian. I've been a librarian. I've been a, a lifelong gamer, a board game designer. My most recent game came out about three months ago, actually going, going, going. Um, so I was involved with libraries and how libraries use games and understanding the power that games have when they're put into a community space. And then I went off to Hogwarts for a year. I was a visiting professor at MIT um, and worked for, I was uh, there at the, uh, the uh, Comparative Media Studies Department. I worked with the Gambit uh, Game Lab, which has now morphed into the MIT Game Lab. Uh, sort of lurked around the education arcade and uh, so spent a lot of time there throwing myself out of libraries and into the, the playful space of MIT. So when I came back to Syracuse, I actually changed up my lab and it's now called Because Play Matters because I really got to thinking about the importance of play and not only games but, but also play and started this group called the Game Designers Guild. Now this group was inspired by some of my experiences at MIT. So this is the Infinite Corridor and it's a long a long hallway that connects a bunch of buildings at MIT. And as you're walking down it, on the sides on the walls, there's all these posters for various student organizations. Things like, you know, you've got Quidditch, and you've got Acapella, and you've got Killer, you know, the Assassin game, and you've got all these, all these activities. And the thing about these groups is most of these groups are open to anyone who wants to come. They're not just student groups. They're groups that happen to have students in them. So the year I was there, I actually I lived in the dorms, that's quite an experience for a 40-year-old to go back and live in the dorms with 16 to 18-year-olds. But while I was there, I went ahead and took advantage of some of these organizations and did all sorts of crazy stuff. But what I really liked was the environment it created. It created this cool space where students and community members all came together around some interesting topic. And I said, you know, I want to do something about that with games. So I came back, I started the lab here where I work on transformative games and play in informal learning environments, but I wanted to do something that was more a community outreach. Now at Syracuse, one of the things they encourage us to do as faculty members is something called scholarship in action. They want us to take something we're doing and take it out into the real world. And so that's why I started the Game Designers Guild. The idea behind this is I wanted to make an organization that was kind of like those things at MIT. That was a space for anyone who was interested in games to come together and explore game design that was open to the community. I set it up to have it on Friday nights because I knew Friday nights would be one time people could actually park on campus. Those of you that know that, that if you're going to start a community group, you need to have a time when people park. I also experimented with where we held it. So this is actually one of the meetings of the guild. Um, we're in a mall, as you see, with lens crafters there in the back. <laughs> and so this was, we were doing actually a little mini uh, game jam at this point. But so we've got a mother who brought her kid. We've got a local teenager. You know, we've got a couple students who are there from the university. We have some professors. It's this joining space of game stuff. And there isn't a games program at Syracuse. And so as someone suggested, when I was talking about the impact this was having, they said, well, you know, it's kind of like there was a vacuum and you lit a match and, and everything went whoop around it. So it really began to build up steam and began to draw in gamers and draw in kids and draw in students. But the nice thing is it was an opportunity for people who had an interest in games to do something with games without having to take a class, without having to be in a program, a chance to go outside and explore what's going on. So we meet on Friday nights once a month. The general structure is the first half an hour, I bring some wacky game. I try to bring stuff that people haven't seen before, because I want, I want to increase their game toolkit. So we've done Johann Sebastian Joust, which certainly baffled people. For Christmas, they walked in and they could go to the naughty table or the nice table, where we had apples to apples and cards against humanity. <laughs> you can guess where most people were by the end of it. And then the parent comes in with a seven-year-old, and I'm like, let me take you to this game over here. <laughs> cards against humanity. No. Um, <laughs> So, so I try to bring wacky sort of big games. We did Ninja, remember playground game Ninja? You know, we've done that sort of thing. Uh, something other than the typical AAA titles, but showing people indie games and things like that. And then from 6 to 7 o'clock, what we do each time is we invite someone from the community who has the need for a game to come in and talk. 
So we have had people from local battlegrounds, from libraries, from museums, from after school programs, from different groups who have a need and most of them don't have any idea how they'd use a game, but they've got an idea of a problem. So one was a librarian who I happened to be talking with them and they said, well, we're gonna do Candyland at our library. Like, what do you mean? I said, well, we're gonna make a big Candyland board and like, I hope people are gonna draw cards and move to a space. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, well, why don't you come to the Game Designers Guild, we'll talk. Um, so uh, what we do is we bring in members of the community who have the need for some sort of a game or gameful space. The Science Museum came and they're like, we don't know, let's just talk. So for an hour we have a big brainstorm. It'd be like a group like this, we bring in these folks from the outside and we brainstorm about what kind of game might work. And we explore that for about an hour. And then at seven o'clock, the, the last two hours are open to anyone that's brought a game they're looking to have play tested. So what we then do is say, does anyone have a game? If so, stand up, tell us about your game. Where are you gonna be? We have, in the room we meet, we have a combination of screens on the walls that they can plug into. So if they've got a digital game, they can bring that, or tabletop games. We also invite the speaker, whoever presented and ran the brainstorming, to park at a table. Say, anyone that wants to continue working on this game, come up here. So then there's another couple hours of work. And then what happens off of that are different, different paths. And that's what I'm gonna talk about now, are five of the projects that came out of this process over the last year. This is what we don't do. This was at the New York State Fair this last year. It was very easy to get a picture of it because no one was playing it. Um, there's the, so the, the idea was you flipped a coin and then you moved on a board. And it's like really, you spent, yeah. So in my, uh, I teach a designing serious games class and there's two rules at the beginning of that class and I use these same two rules with everything else we do. Number one, no games where you roll a die and move a piece on a track. That's out. Number two, no asking trivia questions off of cards. That's also out. And we go to try and make the, the activities you do in the game to relate to something in the real world. So this is what we don't do. So I'll go through a few of the projects. So this was the first group, Fort Stanwix. It's a national battleground that's in the Syracuse area. And um, they came up and they said, you know, we want a game to just help people understand what went on here. So then that's, that's all of the extent they brought. So we're exploring, do we do a tower defense game? Do we do something that's a shooter? But as we explored it, we got to thinking about what's interesting about this is not the battles that went on, but the stories of the people who were there. So we ended up making this game called Stories from Stanwix. And the idea was to explore the stories of individuals who were affected by this fort being such a key point during the battle. Uh, we ended up, first we used it, we built something out in Eris and prototyped it and found that when we went out to a battlefield that had no Wi-Fi and no connectivity, <laughs> that it didn't work. And so I was very happy yesterday to go to the, the Tailbla Tailblazer workshop and learn that Tailblazer does not require that online connection, so yay. But in the interim, we ended up turning to something called Choice Script, which is like Twine, but harder. Um, and, but it allowed the people who are there, now the people that are coming, they're not game designers for the most part. They're people who are gamers. They may have tried to do something, but I'm leading them through this process. So we're looking for tools to help them explore the process. So stories from Stanwix, we built a prototype of it. The idea was to have something that would actually be out there in the field. You would explore the stories of people who lived there. You'd make choices. Um, but then the government happened and the, uh, they took away all the money from the national parks and this place had to shut down. And so that project ended. Um, another project that we did, so a librarian from another university came and she said, you know, we want some kind of orientation activity. That was the seed. So we talked to her about what they wanted to do and they wanted to have something where people went out around campus and got to know the campus a little bit but got to do research in the library. So we ended up having the whole campus be haunted. We got people from six different departments to volunteer and what they did is they put on these scenes and every 15 minutes six hauntings would happen and the hauntings were happening because something was unresolved. The students had to go to the place, observe what was going on, then get back to the library, talk to other people, figure out what they had just seen and what was missing, and then go back 15 minutes later and resolve it. And that was basically it. They, had, they knew the hauntings were happening every 15 minutes. They had to figure out what was going on. So over the night, they did. So it got people engaged going out on campus and coming back in. And everyone that helped run this were people in the Game Designers Guild. So we helped develop this. We helped the library put it on. The Science Museum came up and they said, how can we be more relevant to teens? So what we did is we worked with, actually there's a group that funds uh, summer work programs for some of the rougher neighborhoods within Syracuse. And we actually brought in teens from those programs into the museum. Most of these teens had never been to the Science Museum. So we brought them in at nine in the morning, we let them run around the museum for a while, and then we had five stations set up like this. And we said, okay, within half an hour, pick a station that you like, and then you're gonna make a game that fits within that exhibit. We had a docent from the museum sit down with the kids and spent all day helping them to create games that might live on in the museum. The museum was open this day. 
So we actually had museum patrons coming in and actually working with these teens. And it was cool, the teens who they finally got to the point of having a game testing. And they're testing it with actual patrons coming in. And it was really neat for a lot of these folks who'd never had something like that happen before. Two interesting things happened during this day. Um, one was the teens. So we had lunch. We brought everyone in. We said, OK, here's pizza. Here's pop. You can use your mobile devices. This was the one time they were allowed to actually use their mobile devices. You've got an hour. Hang out as long as you want. So they're busy eating and things like that. And one of the groups came up and said, hey, can we go back to working on our game? It was about 10 minutes in. And I said, well, sure, if you want. And so that group gets up and leaves. And then all of a sudden, the whole room empties out. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. These are teenagers who have just been offered unlimited pizza, pop, and Wi-Fi, you know, and they're ready to run back out and work on their games. The other thing that happened is the docents. When I'd set this up, they volunteered. They said, OK, well, we're open that day. We can each be there in your exhibit for about half an hour to get the kids started. We'll come back at 3 and help judge them all and take a look at them. So half an hour in, I'm doing my rounds, wandering around, and I find that the docents are still there. Another hour, they're still there. And the docents ended up spending all day with these groups because they found, hey, here's people, teens, willing to talk about this stuff I've been putting my life towards. So it was really neat to see those effects happen. Now, in order to do this kind of game creation thing, what we do is the people in lab coats are members of the Game Designers Guild, and they are serving as facilitators. So they're actually staying with the groups as well, helping to facilitate the game design process. And that's a significant difference between these game jams and other game jams, is that we know we don't have people who are experienced designers. So instead, we have facilitators who stay with the group. They have a timeline of what, the, what needs to happen. And as we say, as you get closer to each boundary on that timeline, help a little more. But I had to do training on facilitating, helping them understand, we're not going to judge you based on the quality of what your group does. Let this come from the group. Your job is to just help them make sure they have something by 3 o'clock, you know, something that we can put out. So then here was the Candyland, what the Candyland game turned into. So this was a local public library. Um, they had already done some of the brochures and things, so we had to kind of work within those structures <laughs> and say, all right, so you're, you're doing Candyland, huh? All right, so we'll work on this. What we ended up making was a LARP for kindergartners. So the way it worked, the storyline was, and, and everything I'm saying here was not from me. It was from this guild. It was from people from the Syracuse community who were gamers. And I was just facilitating them, understanding their years of being a gamer, how that can be used to inspire others. So we brought in this, the kids. We said, here's the deal. We've got a time machine. We need to send some people back in time. There's a mama dinosaur who's got some eggs she can't find, but it's underpowered because, you know, we're a library, we don't have a lot of money. So all we can do is we can send through little people, we can't send through big people. So we need you all to go through the time machine. So the first thing they had to do is they had to go do research. Go find out what kind of dinosaur you want to be. So they went out, they did research, and then we did face painting on them based upon what sort of dinosaur they wanted to be. They got to have a special ability. You know, okay, do you roar? Do you fly? Do you have a tail? You know, what do you do? And then they went out in groups and went through a series of challenges. So it was a LARP on rails for kindergartners. And they were exploring team building and working together. And as they did this sort of exploration, they were, the library was celebrating getting these dinosaurs. So it was really cool seeing the kids interact in a way that would have been, draw a card, you got a blue, let's go down the path to the next blue card. But instead, and it was a lot of convincing of the librarians, helping them to be willing to take a risk on something that was so outside of their normal comfort zone. But it worked. It got the kids working together and sometimes looking very scary in their face paints. But anyway. The Everson Museum of Art brought in the uh, Art of Video Games exhibit. So this is again in Syracuse. And the first thing they asked me to do was to come and talk with their uh, docents about why video games are not scary. But we ended up doing two things with them. One, we did a, a program called Beyond Monopoly, where we brought a bunch of modern board games. We had some board game documentaries running. But the more interesting thing was this. We did a game jam for families, where Play-Doh was the main component. So we had kids from 3 to about 80 working together to make games out of Play-Doh. And so they, they all got stuff from the dollar store, then they all had a tub of Play-Doh, and they made games. And the coolest thing that happened from this was, if you note this game here, I got an email later that night from the parents of this kid saying he was so excited. As soon as he got home, he remade his game. And we've been playing it all night. He and his mom have now become regular members of the Game Designers Guild. And now they're coming back, and they're making games, and he's bringing new games to test. So, the lesson I've learned is don't make games for the community. Instead, help the community make games for themselves. Now, if you want to do this yourself, here's my first steps. Figure out where you want to be, where people can park. Big problem for universities. Collect some weird games they've never seen. Market to the gamers in your community. Reach out to them. 
Reach out to informal learning institutions because you will find very few of them will turn you down. You say, hey, hey, we'd like to offer you some free consulting, but don't promise anything more than brainstorming because you never know where it's going to come out. That's what I found. They may come in wanting X and you're going to come out with sending them on a LARP for kindergartners, you know, but let that process happen. Create a very playful atmosphere, but most importantly, be a facilitator. Help people to come up with the ideas. Don't be the one saying, I know everything, I'm going to fix this, but instead facilitate it. What I'm trying to do now is build the Game Designers Guild Hall. So if the idea of this is it'll be a website with a lot of resources so that libraries or educators or community organizations can actually start one of these on their own. You all know a lot about gaming, but a lot of folks out there don't who might want to start one. But we can put together those resources. So I'm currently seeking funding for this. This is the next step of this project. So if you want to keep up with what we're doing, if you go to becauseplaymatters.com, there's a little place, it's a blog for my research lab, a little link that says subscribe, that'll let you know what's going on. And you can read what's happening there, learn about the thing we did actually last Friday at the school where I ran a surprise LARP for SU faculty, for Syracuse faculty, who were expecting to come to a reception, and instead they got thrown into an adventure where they had to explore a bunch of our research labs to help us deal with the virus that was running rampant through the labs. So that's the sort of stuff we're up to. But with that, I see we're out of time, so I will yield the floor to the next speaker. So thank you much, and help people change the world.